DJ's Fun Podcast, everybody. Thank you very much. My next guest is a singer, songwriter, holistic health coach, broadcaster, keynote speaker, and number one best-selling author. She's an extremely passionate about all things holistic, from organic food, clothing, chemical-free cleaning, and natural birth and parenting. Uh, she's been the co-host on BBC Radio 2, Steve Wright in the Afternoon Show, for 18 years. Hush, my juicy friends, as I'm about to say grace. But what kind? Janie Lee, to be precise. Yes, where's Janie? Janie, <laughs> What an intro, Jane. <laughs> what an intro. Actually, you know what? I think it's about 21 years now. <laughs> How oh, really scary good? is that? Yeah. <laughs> you can just be right in the afternoon. And actually, that whole clappy thing at the beginning of all the podcasts that I do. Yeah, you uh, stole it. <laughs> I did. Oh, no, I, I like to use the word model, Jane. Yes, of course, of course. Yeah. I like to use the word model, but I loved it. Ever since I was fortunate enough to go on Steve's show, and thank you for that, by the way, I was, I was knocking on his door for years and managed to get on Steve right in the afternoon show, who I've admired. Yeah, I mean, even from Radio 1 and then all the way to Radio 2. And I had no idea till I went on there that, of course, you'll do the old clappy thing yourself. Of course, who else is in there? Yeah, exactly. Of course, we ask the guests to clap along. Why would you not? Clap yourself they, always. <laughs> they do. Listen, there's so much to cover in a relatively short space of time. Uh, your career has just gone in so many different twists and turns, all the way from, I mean, where do we really start? I mean, I was talking about you to somebody yesterday. And they said, oh, that's that holistic. I said, but she's done a billion things. I said, you know, she was a backing singer for Wham and Kim Wilde and Boy George. Their chin nearly dropped. She went, no. <laughs> I said, yes. So a lot of people don't know that. So before we get into the health holistic stuff, which clearly my podcast is mainly about health, and we're going to really touch on alcohol with your incredible new book. So I really want to touch on that because that's not only doing well, but changing so many lives at such an important time. So that's where the main focus is going to be. However, I want people to know about your career. So, you know, yeah. you were a backing singer for WAP. Talk us through that, Kim. Well, yeah. So, well, in the very early days, I did a degree in performance arts, which was really just kind of three years of showing off, and then decided, you know, that I wanted to be a singer. And my very first job was with Mary Wilson and the Wilsations, if you remember Mary with the Beehive. Oh my so that was great God. fun. And then, well, in fact, a friend who was a drummer told me that, wham, they'd literally just appeared with Young Guns and they said they were putting a, you know, a band together to go on tour. So I rang up the tour manager, went along for a kind of initial audition. The boys weren't there. It was just a few members of the band. But then they said, you know what, we really want a section, a vocal section. And back then, you know, there were sections like Kokomo were one, you know, kind of big time vocal section. And it was kind of just me. And I thought, oh, no, this is not going to work. So anyway, I thought, you know what, this is worth a try. So I just rang up a friend who I'd been singing with doing session work. And then I rang up Lee Bellow from Light of the World. You probably remember some of these bands. And we just said, listen, let's be a section. So let's just rehearse by phone. And then the next audition, we'll rock up as a section, give ourselves a name and rock up. So we did and we got the gig. How cool is that? That's just fantastic. And then from, <laughs> and then from I mean, because Wham, I mean, obviously they were, sh- I mean, they were massive. I still love Wham now because I, mm. I like that. I've always been a big boy band fan. But I've got Kim Wilde here as well and Boy George. I don't know who else. Kim Wilde, by the way, was my first ever concert. Weird that. Oh, wow. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I didn't work with her in the early days. I worked with her when she was doing stuff much later in the early 90s. So a lot of it was kind of gigs around Europe. She's massive in Europe. I don't know if people even realise that. France, you know. know um, Yeah, huge. So, yeah, so I was doing some of those dates later, not the kids in America time, but much later on. She's so lovely, Kim. Just absolutely lovely. I had a great time doing those gigs. And what about Boy? Uh, Or George? Oh, yeah, I loved working. I loved working. You know what? I mean, underrated doesn't cover it. Seriously, how underrated is George? Really? Such a fantastic singer. Absolutely amazing singer and songwriter. I loved working with him. I only did a bunch of gigs and some TV shows and various bits and bobs. But yeah, it was a great time. He calls me he calls me Janie with the yellow hair. <laughs> I mean, you say he's underrated. I mean, he was huge. I mean, he, he was. was. When I say underrated, I just mean, I think, you know, for a long time, his image was the kind of thing that you thought about with George. And very rarely did people say, have you actually checked some of those songs? Right. You know, in terms of him as a songwriter, really very special. Has he come back recently? Yeah, yeah. He's doing stuff again now. Weirdly, funny enough, Chris Moyles, who is a friend really now, his missus, manages Boy George. It's a small one. Oh, wow. So Amazing. It's, it's, and she also manages Pele. You couldn't have a more just <laughs> could you? Do you know what I mean? Cool. 
very, very odd thing. Listen, you told me a story, by the way, a bit of history with me and Janie, by the way, just to tap in here. I've known Janie for, I mean, years now. I mean, yeah, years. I think my little girl, well, my little girl's 15 now. And, and I think I came out to my first juice retreat when she was, oh goodness, I don't know, about two. So yeah, that's a lot of years. And that's obviously I knew of you before that because of your books. 13 years. And which one did you come to? Was it one in Turkey? Oh, it's Turkey. Be... Yeah, it was Turkey. And was it up the mountain? It was up the mountain. Yeah, definitely. And... I went there a few times. And Beautiful on, the first place. One, on the first one, was that when you did your first talk? Not your first ever talk. I mean, but you kindly offered to do a talk for all the guests there. Um, yeah, I think so. It, yeah, it was definitely early on. Yes, I think it was actually. And in fact, I know exactly what happened. It was because, you know, I very quickly got the vibe and heard, you know, the stuff you were talking about, which was just so fantastic and saw all of these people. For some of them, it was the very first time they'd ever done any kind of a detox, right? Yeah. And and they were sort of immediately out there in the sunshine, detoxing, only having the juices and the smoothies, you know, and and yet they were still spraying all this stuff on their skin and it drove me bonkers. So that's when I said to you, listen, I need to have a word. <laughs> so, so just to shed a little light for those that don't know what you're doing, you're talking about spraying stuff on people's skin. That must seem weird, yeah. out of context. But I, mean, I think your book was already out by then. Your number one best-selling book, you've had a few, obviously, we'll touch on those, but Imperfectly Natural Woman really- Yeah, that was set, the first one. Really set this area, if you will, this external, Internal detoxing on fire, I would say. It was, it, was the, mm. it was the one that really put it on the map. Now, that was already out, I mm. Zoom when you kindly did that talk for our guests up the mountain. I think it was already there, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I sometimes joke, you know, say I was a bit ahead of my time really with that book because, you know, I was, I covered everything in that book about holistic living. And I sometimes joke that I was kind of writing about coconut oil and kale before they had their own publicists, you know, because now, of course, everyone is. It was quite a new thing. A lot of the ideas in that book were quite radical, actually, or at least at the time. But yeah, it did do really well. I think mainly because my title, I'm so grateful that I used the word imperfectly natural rather than, you know, here's me getting everything right, which clearly no one does. But yes, the book essentially is all aspects of holistic living. And I suppose if you kind of sum it up, it's around kind of looking for the natural approach to everything. And obviously that's food and sustainability, but it's also what you put on your skin because, you know, your skin is the largest organ and so many of us forget this. So we eat really well and we do our meditation and we do our exercise. And we, then we completely forget that we're putting huge numbers of synthetic chemicals on our skin, which is super bad for us and super bad for the planet. So that was kind of what got me going when I came out and on the it's, retreat. It's still very much a passion of yours today. And, oh, yeah. and there's no question question it's one of the rare timeless books i would say because you could pick that up now as if you picked it up 16 years ago whenever it was and it's still standing the test of time i mean mm. you pick it up now all the tips that you give of you know where you can wash your clothes without having to have all these kind of chemicals detergents i don't know if i heard it from you jamie or not but there was somebody it might it must have been you because you're the only person i really know in this field to be honest with you how many chemicals the average woman i mean it could be personal, mm. but woman in particular has in their, you know, yeah, bag. yeah. Yeah, that's something I talk about a lot. It's the fact that, you know, most of us, if we go away, not anyone does anymore, but <laughs> in the days when we did, <laughs> you know, you'd kind of take your um, cosmetics bag or whatever, you'd have a whole load of stuff in there. And then you get home and in your bathroom cabinet, you've got a whole load of bottles. And then under your sink, you've got a whole load of bottles. And then maybe you've got a little makeup bag as well. I mean, it's literally unbelievable. And when you add all of those together, that is one hell of a lot. I mean, potentially thousands yeah. of different synthetic chemicals. And this is all is my thing. It's that, you know, no one bottle of shampoo or shaving foam is going to be a problem. Of course it isn't. It's the cumulative effect of all the thousands and thousands of different chemicals. When you think that each bottle can contain goodness knows how many, and even if a product has got some perfume in it or parfum, whatever you want to call it, scent effectively, okay. we tend to think, oh, it's got a bit of scent in it. But actually just that one bit of scent can contain up to a hundred different synthetic chemicals. So no wonder it messes with our respiratory, you know, problems and gives us insomnia and headaches and all the rest of it on a low level, of course, no, of course. But over time but over it builds time, up. Right? Exactly. It's like one cigarette a day never killed anybody. It's the cumulative yeah. effect. And that of course is why people think 
the, it doesn't affect them because on day-to-day stuff, it doesn't appear to. But of course, as you were saying, it's the accumulative effect. It's like what you do most of the time determines your health. Absolutely. And yeah. it was a real eye-opener for me as well because I was at the retreat, like you said, we're all, for want in a better word, before anybody starts talking about, oh, your body detoxes itself. Yeah, we know all that. I've covered that in other podcasts, right? It, <laughs> it's just a word. Relax, people. But people understand what that word fundamentally means. So when we're detoxing, internally essentially when we're giving the body chance to do what it needs to do by having fresh juices and everything else like you said you then see all these other chemicals even the suntan lotions that are that, yeah. that are going on being plastered on some are better than others obviously but you, you know you you were looking at and i never really thought of that i just think you know and no one did until you did the first talk and it was like oh my god you can even wash your clothes without chemicals i didn't know that yeah. and you know like, yeah. it's like the old wives tale stuff like these tips Lemon juice for almost everything when it comes to <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. And bicarbonate like, soda, don't forget bicarbonate that. Bicarbonate soda and lemon juice. It's almost like leeches back in the day. You know what I mean? It's like these, these, two, yeah. these two things will do just about everything. But yeah, I think people do need to look at both of those aspects. And, and in amongst the books that came after that, of course, you did Imperfectly Natural Baby and Toddler, which I think is even more important. Mm, yeah, definitely. That was the point at which I started looking into all of this, you know, when I was pregnant with my first child. And I think that can happen for a lot of women, actually. They get pregnant and then they suddenly think, oh my goodness, I've got to not only look after myself for me, but for, you know, the baby I'm carrying. And in addition, I want to leave some of the planet behind, you know. So it can often be the time when you open your eyes to just different approaches. And of course, since I wrote that first book, things have come on massively. And as I say, I was a bit ahead of my time. But now it's, of course, it's common knowledge that we need to look at our carbon footprint and we need to do things as naturally as possible. But the market's changed. You know, there now is, I think when I wrote that very first book, there were about five cosmetic companies that I managed to research that were 100% natural. Oh my goodness. I mean, there are literally thousands now, thousands. And there is literally a natural alternative to everything. And some of the stuff I talk about, yes, you're going to have to put your hand in your pocket and buy some stuff, but lots of it you can just make yourself. You know, there are things you can just knock up in your kitchen. As you say, with bicarbonate soda and lemon juice, you can do quite a lot. <laughs> and it's, also, it's also a great deal of this is a bit like the food industry. It's a self fulfilling prophecy. And I'm guilty of it myself. I use moisturizer. Um, I'm a man. I'm allowed to say it these days. It's fine. Um, mm. But why do I? need moisturizer it's because i put on moisturizer right the need for moisturizer is caused by moisturizer right that's been clinically proved for the vast majority of us it ultimately does the opposite of what you want it to do and so you you require the need for it. it's a bit like chapstick you know it's the same thing you can be fine with the chapstick the minute you start to use it's almost addictive to a lot of people and i think the cosmetic industry like the food industry know a lot of this and so therefore they have this they, they need the lifetime value of a customer of course, so if they can have something that actually causes the very thing that it appears to get rid of, it's a genius exactly. trick. Low blood sugar levels is not taken away by something that spikes your blood sugar. It appears to be because it's a very clever trick, but you're going to have even more of a low blood sugar, which means the need to have <laughs> the quick fix is even greater. And that's where it goes into. This isn't a COVID podcast or anything like that, but we will touch a little bit on the, my view. People know my view. I don't hide my view. I'm very clear on my view. Right. And I don't understand. I'm here in Spain. I'm looking outside the window now. I'm blessed enough to be right next to a beach. There's two people. As I'm looking, as I'm talking to you right now, there is a couple that clearly know each other. Uh, they've got masks on while they're walking along the beach by themselves, by the sea, not because they're stupid, because by law they have to. Now, bear in mind, this is by the sea, vitamin D. They should be breathing in fresh air. Kids now, at the time of this recording, wearing masks in school all those hours a day. There's no proof whatsoever. Is your view that it's doing more damage to their health or what, what is your view on any of this kind of stuff? Mm, no, I absolutely agree that, you know, there's definitely a level of insanity and absolute scaremongering. And, you know, I get super frustrated about the fact that, you know, all this stuff we've been talking about, the natural approach has never once been discussed. Why wouldn't we be reminding people, as you say, the importance of vitamin D and vitamin C? You know, I did an interview with a leading doctor and heart specialist, Dr. Thomas Levy, around vitamin C and the importance of vitamin C and just how incredible it is for any kind of issue, let alone alone, you know, infection and COVID. Uh, the minute I put it on YouTube, I got put in the naughty chair. Well, right? I got it got it got taken off straight away. Well, you do. You, I was incensed. It was just about vitamin you're C. Allowed. No, you. We're, the, the, there is a silencing going on. This isn't a conspiracy theory. This is critical thinking theory. This isn't a conspiracy theory. It's it's genuinely happening all over the place. No, we can't cannot be in a world where during a health crisis, 
Gyms are closed. Health retreats are closed, but McDonald's, Burger King, and Pizza Hut are open. But anyway, that's that. But it is important that we talk about it a little bit, I suppose, because it is very real. And of course, the knock-on effect, you know, the 3 million cancer appointments that have been missed and people dying and suicides, uh, which brings me on to a neat segue, but it's very important, is the subject of alcohol, which is where your attention is. Very Focus now and your timing couldn't have been better, not for you, but for those that really need it, Jane. And- yeah, well, I mean, certainly people have upped the ante in terms of booze during lockdown. I mean, you know, I'm fortunate that I'm connected with a lot of people who managed to stop drinking during lockdown. But if you look at the reports in the mainstream media, it's really terrifying the way sales of alcohol have gone but up. It's, and, it's, and it's not surprising, it, is it really? You know, so people are stuck in their house. It's since records began, Jane. There's bigger alcohol sales at home since records began. And also, there's been more alcoholic deaths in 2020, stroke 2021 in the UK than at any other time since records began. And yeah, yeah. there's, as we speak now, pubs are about to open in Scotland as the time of this recording, yeah. and they're not allowed to sell alcohol. A pub without alcohol, ridiculous. Uh, and they've been suffering quite a lot as well. But alcohol abuse, domestic violence has gone through the roof. We know that. We know that child yeah. abuse has gone through the roof. And all these virtue signers, you know, often blue tick brigade, you know, no offense, but I know a few of them. And you just think, come on, have a voice. And what they often do is they're in their massive houses, their massive gardens. I grew up in an estate. I was 14th floor on a council estate. There's nowhere to get any air. And when they close the parks yeah. and everything else, and, you know, you could just have your partner just lost their job. You could have four kids running around. They don't live in that world when they're making No, it's heartbreaking. And so what mm. they do, they turn to, and this brings us back to the subject, which is so vital now. They turn to an alternative friend that can do something for them, or so they perceive, of course. Mm. So mm. what they do, they go, well, what else is there? I'm going to eat a load of junk, and I'm going to at least have a bottle of wine every single night, at least. And you and I know that's probably a bottle and a half, and during lockdown probably too. Now, your book, Happy, Healthy, Sober. I love your uh, sobriety rocks, by the way, uh, talk mm-hmm. on TED Talk. If you get a chance, by the way, people, uh, TEDx Talk that Jane Lee Grace did, and then your club itself is called The Sober Club. So you've got The Sober Club, Sobriety Rocks. All of that stuff makes it so positive. It's not doom and gloom. It's such a positive approach to stopping alcohol, getting rid of it, getting rid of it, right? yeah. giving it up. So yeah, exactly. tell me the whole alcohol you know, what made you stop and what's your life been since you stopped? Mm. Well, you see, what's interesting is, you know, we've been just been talking for ages about the, the books that I wrote, and the work that I've been doing for all these years, you know, kind of 15 to 20 years of talking about holistic living and being absolutely passionate about good food and nutrition and, and juicing after I'd met you and, and what you put on your skin and, and sustainable cotton. I mean, everything, cleaning your home without chemicals, literally queen of the holistic picture. And yet <laughs> I was drinking pretty much every goddamn day. Yeah. And somehow I seem to think that was OK. I mean, I look back and I just think, what the hell? But of course it wasn't my inverted commas fault because everyone else was doing it too. And it's, you know, your phrase, the only drug you have to justify not taking, right? You said that and you're quite bloody right. I want to pause on that as well, that one sentence as well. It really is. It is it's such an odd thing to have to do that i observed many years ago when i stopped drinking i do i, I hold my hands up i do drink every now and then now and i'll come on that in a minute but i stopped for 14 years and during those 14 years i remember particularly at the beginning because i was young relatively when i stopped i was 29 28 whatever it was so i never had a drink in my entire 30s at all right i just and i think that's one of the reasons why i was successful in writing books and everything else but that's something else we'll get onto in a minute but i remember going out with my friends this that and the other and they would like, why don't you drink? Why don't you drink? And it seemed to be the biggest deal on earth for them. And then I flipped it around and I would say to them, I didn't realize you had an alcohol problem. They go, well, I haven't got a problem. You must have. I said, yeah, exactly. so you've got a problem that I don't drink. So therefore you have my drinking problem. <laughs> so so, so, so the, do you know what I mean? I don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't have a drinking problem, but you do. Right. And then, yeah. And because you have a problem with my drinking. So thank you for inheriting my ex drinking problem. Cause I don't have it anymore. Um, exactly. but they assume that you, you must be an alcoholic. I remember when I first wrote the book, uh, Kick the Drink, and I was like, hang on, what's your definition of an alcoholic? I asked somebody who was accusing me of being an alcoholic because I stopped. And, and I said, what's your definition of being an alcoholic? And they said, well, you know, somebody who drinks all the time. I said, well, I've just told you I don't drink at all. So that definition needs a freaking reevaluation. And then they yeah. said, no, 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 but if you have a drink, you'll need another one. And I said to him, I was in the pub at the time drinking uh, pineapple juice. And I said, is that your fourth pint? He nearly wanted to punch me. He said, are you saying I've got a problem? 
I went, well, doesn't it seem as absurd? I said, if we was in a heroin pub, if there was such a thing, and imagine you're injecting yourself with heroin, and I'm telling you I don't take heroin, and then you say to me, I've got a problem with heroin while you're injecting. Is that a bit yeah. weird? <laughs> so, so anyway, yeah. so so you realised that you were, you were, again, you felt, did you feel a little bit, Oh, it's a big word, but do you feel a little bit hypocritical when you was doing it? Oh my God. Well, well I mean, the thing is, it was it, uh, for years, I didn't even notice. It was just what everyone did. I mean, I'm very grateful that the title of my books was Imperfectly Natural. Otherwise, <laughs> I, I, you know, I ought to have been lynched because I certainly wasn't getting everything right. But, you know, I, it, it was what everyone did. And I simply didn't notice it. It was just the done thing. It's what everyone did. Yeah. Now, of course, it ramped up, which it does with everyone. And, and when my kids were young and I was massively busy, and, I, you know, I remember I was. Doing, I was used to work on Virgin Radio and I was doing six shows a week and then a telly show on day seven. And it was mad. And that was my, so I thought, treat. You know, my treat time really? was to go and have a glass of wine. And then it builds up and builds up and builds up till I was, you know, I don't know how many I was drinking, but it's not far off a bottle of night, probably something like that. But I always say to people, it isn't about how much you're drinking anyway. It's about that question. Could my life be better physically and emotionally without it? Yeah. That's the question. Yeah. And I knew that it could. I knew that I was drinking too much. I knew I felt like hell. I'd wake up at three o'clock pretty much every day, which is, of course, when the liver is trying to repair. Absolutely. And that's why uh, people don't know, but just to interrupt that's why alcohol interrupts your sleep. And people yeah. realize just that they think it's a false positive because what they think is, oh, I, I can't really sleep unless I have a few glasses of wine. And they don't realize that's the reason why they can't sleep. Uh, yeah. So it makes you fall asleep initially, of course, but then it wakes you up at three. Yeah. More. Anyway, go on. Yeah. It's, not, qu it's not quality sleep at okay. all. And I'd be there and I'd wake up at 3 a.m. and a voice would clearly say to me, what the hell are you doing? This is totally not okay with who you are. You're meant to be this queen of natural living, for God's sake. Just quit with the drinking. You know, it was loud and clear. You know, it's just something I have to stop. It's not that hard, for God's sake. Just stop. Just stop. And then, yeah, just stop. Why don't you, girl? You know, and by 6 p.m. the next night, you know, the wine witch yeah, came back absolutely. and said, oh, sweetie, you've had such a stressful day. You know, look at yourself. You need a break and you need to chill, girl. You know, here's your serving on block. And I'd be off on a roll again. But the thing is, and this is the piece that I, I am so passionate about getting across. In the UK particularly, we think there are two types of drinkers. There are those who are at absolute rock bottom and need alcohol services and, and they're clinically dependent. And by the way, that's a very small number. Yeah. And then we think there's everyone else. Yeah happy social drinkers who just every now and then can't hold their beer. Yeah. Now, I was at neither end of that spectrum. I was definitely not okay with it, but I wasn't at rock bottom. Sure. So what would happen to me was I'd go to a GP about, I don't know, something minor, a vitamin D test or something, or I'd go to a practitioner or a, a therapist. And if I felt comfortable, I might, and this went on for years, I might bravely say, actually, you know, there is just one other thing. Can I just kind of share with you? But I'm a bit worried about my drinking. That took a lot for me to say that. And on every single goddamn occasion, they would look at me and they'd go, well, you know, you seem fine. Tell you what, just have an alcohol-free day, yeah? <laughs> oh, my God, if I had a pound for every time someone said that. <laughs> no, I don't have a frigging off switch. I can't have an alcohol-free day. Yeah. So I'd walk away. And I'll be back on the treadmill. What I now know is that it's not rock bottom or OK. There's a whole spectrum. We call them gray area drinkers, people who can stop, but they don't stop. They don't know how to stop. They don't know how to stay stopped. And they're bloody miserable. And most of them want to quit the booze because they're drinking too much. But when the messages keep on coming, well, I mean, why didn't the doctor say to me, oh, really, you, you think you're drinking too much? Girl, I've got the best suggestion for you. Quit the booze. You're going to feel amazing. It's the best anti-aging secret ever. Yeah, yeah. I've got, just got the best solution for you. This is going to be fabulous. No, they just go, oh, dear. You know, as, it, as if I'd said, I've got a problem eating fruit. Yeah. Really? Well, how can we make it easier for you? But, you know, the perception is, well, you can't possibly be thinking about not drinking again. So let's see if we can make it fit your life no let's not let it fit your life well, you, and that's what kept me stuck for years well it's bound to because the people that you you know most doctors the vast 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 majority as in the vast 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 majority of humans in general in the western world drink alcohol 
So, so yeah, exactly. So therefore, you, you, going to somebody, it's like going to a, a doctor who smokes back in the day. It used to happen. Saying, you know, I, yeah. oh, I think I'm coughing a bit much. Oh, you need to change your brand to camel. <laughs> they, would say, they would say that camel's healthier. It's, 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 it's the same thing. So you're saying you're drinking, you know, whatever it is. And they go, oh, what you need to do is just cut down on the drink. Yeah, yeah exactly. Listen. Have a glass of water in between. And so you've stopped for how long at the moment? Not that it matters. I, um, uh, just over just over three years now, okay. three three years and four, okay. four months. Time. Yeah. It's always a funny one because I've written in my books for so many years. The length of time is, is such an arbitrary thing. So, so mm. I always use the Nelson Mandela analogy. Nelson Mandela was locked up for 27 years in an environment that he didn't want to be in and he just wanted freedom. On the day that he got set free, I remember watching on Sky News. Uh, Sky was actually new at the time as well. Not one person went up to him and said, what are you doing? And, and, and had he gone, what do you mean, what am I doing? Well, you look really happy. Well, of course I'm happy. Well, why are you happy? Well, I've, I've just been set free. Well, hang on, how long have you been free for? Well, about 10 minutes. Well, I wouldn't celebrate yet, Nelson. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean it's, it's yeah. a ridiculous concept. And we have this thing yeah. with drugs of any kind, alcohol, whatever it is, yeah. that we need a length of time to see if we're free or not. Now, what you can do, wait for the rest of your entire life, because no one's going to fax you once you're dead to say, by the way, you did kick it. Um, you know, you yeah. need to acknowledge it immediately. But the reason why most people don't acknowledge it immediately is because they're using what, well, they're using what I describe as the willpower methodology as opposed to freedom mentality, which is what you tap into in your book. Exactly. Exactly. The willpower, as you know, doesn't work. The first few weeks can be a bit tough. Yeah. Any behavior change is yeah. tough. You know, you've got to form your new neural pathways. You've absolutely got to eat well, because otherwise, yeah. you know, the brain chemistry is all over right. the shop and your poor little body's going, oh, my goodness, where's my dopamine? Yeah. And, you know, what am I going to do? So, yeah, there's a lot of stuff needs put in place. But if you focus entirely on what you're gaining, not what you're giving yeah. up, then you can start to change that mentality. And you're absolutely right. Yes, there'll be some tough times. Or, you know, that's life. I mean, I, I'm always amazed. I'm when clients will say to me, you know, I've ditched the booze, I don't know, two months ago, but you know, I'm not feeling great. I'm really down and, you know, or I've got a headache and I just feel everything's miserable. And you know, what, what, what's wrong with me? And the answer is, well, when you were drinking, did, did you never have a crap day? I I mean, come on, you know, our expectations are that we can drink year on year on year, 30 years or something. And then it's all going to be sorted within five days. It's not quite that quick. No. However, you know, if you do focus on what you're gaining, not what you're giving up, literally everything changes. There isn't anything that stopping drinking doesn't improve. That's a bit of a double well, negative, well, saying, but you know well, where I'm coming give the from. Highlights. Give the highlights. People have been listening now. They've been going, right, I need to lift myself out of lockdown. Mm. There's going to be a lot of lift yourself out of lockdown plans, essentially. But none more yeah. important, I feel, at any given time than the alcohol element, which is just so many yeah. lies right now. So they're going to want to go, all right, Janie, I'm on board with you, Right. Give me the positives. Mm. I want to know. Give okay. All right. Well, well, number one, just before we get into the positives, yeah. number one, I think it's super important to have both sides of the piece. So I've got this phrase, you know, emotions, not logic will inspire action. So in other words, you need to feel motivated. And I'm going to give you that motivation in a moment. But just before I do, I do believe you do need a little bit of that logic. So you do need to read Kick the Drink Easily or William Porter's Alcohol Explained, because you do just need to grasp Happy, this well, you've piece. You've forgot the book, the that, main book. Well, yeah, exactly. And of course, but in my all fairness, book. it's much more up to date. I wrote mine like 20 odd years ago. So like, yeah, no, it's true. yeah, no, I, I, I do. I cover it. I cover the, the logic piece in my book as yeah. well. The, the point I'm trying to make is we all need to just get real clarity on exactly what alcohol is, because we genuinely don't have it. I was a pretty bright person doing all of this stuff I was doing. And yet I didn't really realize that alcohol is a depressant, that it's totally addictive. You know, I, I just hadn't quite grasped that. Right. I still believed all those nonsense articles that alcohol is good for you, the absolute rubbish that glass of red wine is good for the heart. For God's sake, no, just have a grape. Right. So I think it's important to get a little bit of a, bit of a sense of that. So you know why you need to know the why you're doing this. And then the next piece is to grab hold of the inspiration. And this is where you're just going to have to trust me when I tell you that, you know, life without booze is freaking fantastic. And every single bit of your life, everything will change. Everything will change for the better. So, if you focus on what you gain. So you're talking about the pie chart of life. So your relationships? Absolutely. Oh my goodness. I mean, anyone who's got any kind of important relate, well, who, who hasn't, yeah, you know, sure. I mean, if you're a parent, if you have a partner, if you have friends, if you have work anyone, relationships, work relationships, all that kind of 
you become present. Yeah. You become present. That's the difference. And you become a much kinder, nicer person. I tell you what, if everyone was sober, the world would be a very different place. I well, swear I tell to you God. what, A&E because- would be a different place, wouldn't it? Well, oh God, well, that's been interesting, hasn't it, over, <laughs> over COVID? Um, but yeah, because people are just kinder. Because when you ditch the booze, you you have to become authentic. You have to look at yourself, yeah. right? And that doesn't necessarily mean that everything's beautiful. I mean, one thing that's quite interesting is I find with some clients, they'll say to me, you know, I've been sober a few months. And one, one woman said I was driving my car and suddenly I was blindsided by how badly I'd behaved in a relationship right. i felt so guilty it was just you know how can i repair the damage i've done right and the answer is of course we've all done things we're ashamed of and we wish didn't happen but far better now to face Absolutely. it and 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 move on apologize if you need to whatever it is people have to deal with different things in different ways but at least from now on you're starting from a place of authenticity it really comes down to starting to like yourself more right and i mean the, the other part of this that's quite amusing is that while I've all these years been writing about holistic living, you know, I was a Hay House author yeah. and I, I also presented on Hay House Radio. So I've interviewed all the gurus, everyone. There isn't anything about self-love and meditation that I didn't know. Mm-hmm. But was I doing it for myself? Of course I wasn't. That'd be ridiculous. No. There's no way I could sit in meditation because <laughs> I didn't like myself very much, right? So that changes when you stop drinking. The scales come off. You get to know who you really are. Yeah, and you also find other passions, presumably. I mean, I know, I'm saying presumably I know oh, yeah. because I stopped 14 years, but so, I mean, you're talking to the converted, but you find other passions and you, and you, like you said, you become present. Presumably one of the benefits I found is mornings. I mean, the point is, is that not only did I have my mornings back fully, as in I had my full day back, mm. but I also had seven days a week back. I know, I know. And this is what's so beautiful because people start to realize, oh, hold on, I'm feeling better. I've got more time. I'm starting to get a little tingle of excitement as to what I can do with my life. So in the sober club, you know, we've got people who have gone back to uni or to do an, an MA or we've got one woman started a charity. Lots of people change their work or they start new businesses. I mean, just super you exciting stuff that, happens. Though? Have you found your work's improved, Jane, since you- Oh, God, yeah. Oh, massively. I'm so much more productive. And, you know, I mean, I always had a lot of energy, but I've got a hell of a lot more now. And also, you know, I think you bring a different kind of just a different presence to the work that you're doing. In terms of creativity, it's absolutely amazing. Oh, my God, you should see some of the work people are turning out once they've stopped drinking. And and that's an interesting one, because, of course, a lot of musos and, you know, we started off talking about the music industry and, and there's a lot of sort of musicians and artists who get fearful that if they ditch the booze, they won't be creative again. But actually the opposite is true. Oh God, yeah. Because they often put it down to a change of mind state and that's why they come up with their best work. Uh, But actually Mm. that is not true. And also on the back of alcohol, depending on how much you have and various, but it's always there to some extent. Not only is there a a little bit of a foggy cloud or an absolute storm going on every day, uh, but I find Mm. that it creates CBA syndrome. I don't know if you've ever yeah, definitely. And if you don't know what CBA <laughs> syndrome is, people listening, we've all suffered from it. But I think those in lockdown would have done more than anything else on alcohol, which is can't be asked, can't be asked mm. syndrome. And it's one of those you miss appointments. You just think I can't be bothered to do that. And but also, it's the things you often do when you've had too much drink that you would never have done ever. No, I mean what's in, what's quite interesting is people often find that you literally step into a new identity when you properly stop drinking, and some people find they're actually quite different people to the ones they thought they were. You know, they aren't actually necessarily the life and soul of the party. They're actually quite introverted, you know and and they they start to learn how to care about themselves. You know, I found I found unfortunately one of the disconcerting things when I stopped drinking was I found that the opposite was true for me personally. <laughs> I was actually hoping if there's any advantage to drinking is that you can blame some of your behavior on it. And so I would go out with everybody. I would pretend to drink weirdly because it was just easier than having the conversation all that time ago because it was many years ago. Now. So I would have a champagne glass and put sparkling water in. It was just easier at the time. So people would then think that I had a drink or whatever. The ones that knew that I wasn't drinking was convinced the next day that I had been because of some of the things that I would say and do. And I'd still wake up and go, mm. I can't blame it now on anything. My stupidity, I can't blame <laughs> on anything. I am that ridiculous person. You know, people don't realize alcohol will cost them, the average drinker, over a hundred thousand pounds. Average drinker, this average, this isn't what somebody's deemed as an alcoholic. Average drinker will spend around a hundred thousand pounds in their lifetime 
on alcohol. I think it's gone up. That was since I read the I think it's about 140,000 now. And then here's another step for you. 25,000 drinkers, probably young going out and everything else, but they will lose something in the region of 2,500 through the back of sofas and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And the stats go yeah. up. And how much junk food do you eat? The knock-on effect to your mental and physical health is extraordinary. Uh, yeah, it really is. That link between anxiety and mental health and, our, and alcohol, it still amazes me that there's not been more work done around that because the link is huge. You know, there's no doubt about it. And yet people don't look at it. I've got so many sober club members who'll rock up to a GP and they'll say, I'm feeling super anxious. You know, I'm really concerned about my anxiety. And they just walk away with antidepressants. They're never asked about the drug. Oh, I always say, I've said it in the, in the book all those years ago, and, and I've just remembered it now, actually, but a few of my friends still uh, have it when we're out, when we look at people people that are drinking and just mm. go what stage are they on right so we call it the three stages of alcohol well i do and i've i've trained my friends and there's the three stages. <laughs> so stage one is what you would call squiffy right so stage one is mm. what most people are attracted to if they are attracted to anything about alcohol is that one glass of wine that kind of squiffy feeling where they go a little bit more loving right so they go i love you right? Stage two is really starting to get annoying, right? So stage two is where they've told you that story 10 minutes ago, they're carrying on, but now they're louder. And now they still love you, but they go, I love you, you bastard, you bastard. I love you. So <laughs> yeah. very loud and annoying. And then stage three is the dodgy one that is just with their fist clenched and simply saying, you bastard. And yeah. so, <laughs> so now they've gone from, I love you, I love you, you bastard, to just you bastard. And these are the three mm. stages of alcohol. And it's a great game to play if you're ever out. And you look, you go, oh, stage two. Oh, stage two to three. Let's, let's <laughs> leave. Let's go. So, yeah. you know, they're on stage three. It's time to go. And I think people listening now will just want some genuine help. And I don't mean AA mm. help. And I'm not knocking AA, neither do you. And it's helped millions of people around the world. But there is an alternative to AA. And there is an alternative of what we call the freedom technique. The problem with any drug addiction at all, is that one part of your brain wants to stop, but the other part wants to continue. That is, unfortunately, the schizophrenia of all drug addicts. That is the problem, which is what you talked about, where you go, that's it, yeah. never again, six o'clock, I'm going to do it, right? And, and yeah. so it doesn't matter whether you feel you really want to or not, what I would say, my advice would be, and I think you'll probably be the same, is that if you feel it's got too much, and you want to change your relationship. So the relationship's got a bit abusive for whatever reason, and you want to change the relationship, then read Happy Healthy Sober. Just have a read. Go and look at the TEDx Sobriety Rocks. You know, go and join the mm. Sober Club. Realize that this isn't some doom and gloom club. It's a freaking great club. <laughs> So much of what I talk about is focus on the what's next. So, you know, the whole days can go by in, in our sober club community. And we're talking about great recipes or, you know, fantastic kombuchas we've found or, you know, some kind of fitness thing that people are doing, all kinds of things, creativity. And it's all underpinned by the sobriety. But we're focusing on all the great stuff. And I think that's the key is if people can just get a bit excited about what might be to come. If you told me four years ago, that I would be the kind of person that wasn't terrified of getting older. Because as a woman, it's bloody scary getting older. And four years ago, I was terrified. I just thought, oh my God, everything about this is not okay. I don't want to look old. I don't want to not have energy. I, I, I don't want any of it. But I don't feel like that now. So if you can kind of catch sight of just how exciting your life will be and better in every way, then it's almost like I'm dangling that carrot at the end of the stick and say, listen, come this way. Keep focusing on this. Because this is where the freedom lies. You won't be able to see it when you're on day one, no. right? It feels impossible. Yeah. But if you keep pushing through and keep being inspired, it really is that thing of keep focusing on what you're gaining. That's how to get through this. I mean, my book's got so much other stuff in it. It's not, you know, there's a whole section on how to ditch the booze, but then there's a massive section on all these other aspects of health and well-being, you know, including how to use NLP techniques and, and meditation and mindset and fitness and creativity you that. I mean, you and just NLP everything. And you trained in EFT as well. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I use it a lot with clients because, you know, it really helps just like sometimes very simple exercises help people just get rid of limiting beliefs. And as we all know, it's all that limiting belief stuff. If people walk around saying, well, I can't do that. I'm an anxious person. Well, is that true? Or is that just a limiting belief? Can we knock that out of your big wall of, of beliefs that were handed to you when you're a kid? Wouldn't it be good if we had the money, right? Wouldn't it be cool to have a... Uh... A sober island. Uh, but, but then I thought, sober island's a bit thing. So I thought, what about Freedom Island? 
Mm-hmm. And you've just got this island, this freedom island. People come. Those that aren't free yet, they come to get free. Um, and you've got this whole island of living, people just producing stuff, having a great time, having sober nightclubs, having this and the other. Mm-hmm. And you just go, there's something in there. Unfortunately, I'm not a multimillionaire, so we can't. So, <laughs> so I'm sure somebody listening, right? If you've got the money, come on, Freedom Island, right? <laughs> It really is about freedom, though. I mean, I love that expression, you know, you used about that freedom mentality. That's exactly what it is. And, you know, in the sober club, sometimes we talk about really little things like a few months ago and it was snowing in the UK. And one woman said that, you know, she'd only been sober for a week or something. And her little boy came running in at six o'clock on a Sunday morning. He's like, mum, 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 the snow outside. And she literally sort of pulled her boots on over her pajamas and went out and made snow angels. Right. But literally two weeks before that, she'd have just put the covers over her head and said, well, off you go. I, honestly, I grew up with, well, you know? if you read my book, you know, I, I grew up with a, a family of drinkers. I mean, heavy, 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 heavy drinkers, as, as most people were. My, my nan, for my 16th birthday, gave me a hip flask full of whiskey. Oh my God. And that's what they did. She wasn't <laughs> a horrible person. That's what they did. And she would, you know, every Sunday at lunch, even from 14 onwards. I mean, I remember waking up in the lodge in Hamble, which she owned this place called The Lodge, and a restaurant called Bon Appetit back in the day. But anyway, and I remember staying there, and I was, I was must have been 15. I woke up one Sunday morning in there, and she went, oh, you're all right, you're all right, lad. She was a Yorkshire lass. And she went, you're all right, lad. I went, yeah. And she goes, would you like a Scotty? And I was like, what are you talking about, a Scotty? She went, a Scotty is Scotch. No, I wouldn't. I'm 15, and it's Sunday morning. <laughs> I really don't want to score. Yeah. Um, but it's funny because we all joke about alcohol. So there's, I've got a chapter in the book as well that's talked about ha, 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 you know, like, and you go, oh, gee, guess what happened to us three years ago? And it's always these stories surrounding alcohol seem funny on the surface. And then I, I, yeah, dissect, them. So not, and then I dissect them in the book because then we follow it through the person that got so drunk that he fell asleep in a cow pat in the field. Then we followed that story through the fact that oh, that was his fifth time of being late into work and now he's been fired and then he loses his house. And you follow the story from the jokey wasn't that funny. Think about this. This is a hilarious story, but you follow it through and it wasn't in the end. Imagine if you're having a bad day. 18-year-old boy, imagine this, 18-year-old boy drank so much that he forgot where he was, as you do. You should forget where you are and everything else. He woke up at 3 a.m. halfway through peeing on his parents. Mm, Trust me, you're not coming back from that. Now, that is a funny story, (laughs) right? But... He yeah. ended up, the reason why I wrote that in the book is because I knew the story and I, and, and I knew the people involved and he ran mm. away from home. And then the police had to call, they didn't know where he went. And then there was worried. And then he was disowned by his father. And it went on. It was like, the story itself is hilarious. Because it is. We've all got a dark, I've got a really dark sense of humor. I think it's hilarious. I think that's a bad day, fella. But then you look at it and you go, well, what's the knock-on effect? that potentially yeah. has gone on there. People have lost their jobs through alcohol, lost relationships through alcohol, that people have lost their children through alcohol. You know, it, it really is one of the single most abusive substances on planet Earth. Um, yeah, absolutely. And- absolutely. And, and so completely unnecessary, and which is why it really frustrates me, you know, as I say, that when people present with any kind of inverted commas issue, the first response is always, or oh, how can we make it so that you don't have to drink so much or so that you have a little break yeah. as well? People almost never, you know, talk about this amazing positive benefits of just not having any. Or also I like the one where they go, well, I'm going to give up alcohol. There's a book out years ago called How to Give Up Alcohol for a Month. I wrote about it in my book. Um, and the whole idea of the book was to stop drinking for a month to prove that you don't have an alcohol problem. <laughs> my take on that at the time was, well, I tell you what I'm going to write a book called How to Stop Eating Bananas for a Month. Now, if I saw anybody yeah. reading a book called How to Stop Eating Bananas for a Month because they didn't know how to do it themselves, it would prove to me, not that they didn't have a banana problem, <laughs> but they, <laughs> they did. Have a know with a banana problem. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. Look, we've got to acknowledge, I suppose, at the end, there are, there are genuine, and this is where I differ from 20 years ago when I first wrote the book. I thought it was very clear cut. You've already alluded there are grey areas in between. But there are some people who genuinely, you know, have a glass of wine with a meal on a Saturday night and they don't have another glass of wine for another week and this, that, and the other. But yeah, that's right. That's the they have an off They switch. are rare, though. And that's the difference. I think this is the point is that we all think that they are the majority, but they're not. Mm. No, I think, well, I think it's very interesting. I think that there, you know, as I say, there is a spectrum of grey area drinkers and there are some people who genuinely do have an off switch. They can, I mean, I know because my husband was one of them. So, you know, and it used to drive me bonkers (laughs) because of course he would be constantly saying to me, 
Well, why didn't yeah. you just have one? I wanted to kill him when he said yeah. that. What, what are you talking about, just have one? That'd be ridiculous. It's because he genuinely could have one and then literally not think about <laughs> it if there wasn't alcohol in the house for three months, yeah. right? And then he could potentially go to a party and have a bit too yeah. much and not yeah. think about it for a year if there wasn't any around. It was not a thing for him. Just like, you know, as you say, bananas or kiwi sure. fruits aren't a thing for me. I might have one, I might not have one to next year. Yeah right? But it's not a thing. However, this is the really important bit. When something crops up in your life, you know, when when something hits the fan, if you've been using alcohol, in inverted commas, yeah. for the really important stuff. I mean, I remember towards the end of when he was drinking, it's interestingly, even my husband kind of saw the benefits and just thought, well, why, why am I bothering even to have one a year? What the hell is the point? But I saw it, because obviously once I'd stopped, I noticed all this stuff. And I noticed that there would be an occasion where he'd had a really stressful day. And he'd go, oh, God, I need a drink, right? Yeah. And he'd go, oh, that's interesting, right? So I'd watch him and he'd go and pour himself a drink. Now, then perhaps there might be a celebration yeah. and he'd go, oh, let's have champagne. Okay. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you make those associations in your brain that alcohol is what you do when you are sad or angry or fearful or stressed, and what you do when you're celebrating, at some point, it will ramp up at some I point. Agree. Because everyone will have a time that when some kind of crisis hits, and then your coping mechanism is alcohol. And then even if you were a one drink a month person, it can start to creep in every day. Yeah, and people do that with food, same thing. They do it with cigarettes, they do it with all kinds of things. Instead. And I always say, look, if you want to really know if you're hooked on something or not, it doesn't matter what it is, alcohol or anything else, just ask yourself this question. If the thought of never doing it again, whatever it is, right? Builds yeah. you with absolute fear, not a tiny bit of apprehension. I'm talking about absolute fear that you fear you cannot enjoy your life or cope with your life the same way again without what you perceive to be your friend crutch or pleasure. Then you're hooked. If it doesn't, you're not. Yeah. That's it. You know, the thought of getting yeah. rid of bananas doesn't panic me. So, do you know yeah. what I mean? The thought of getting rid of coffee for most people panics them. Now, it's not as bad as alcohol or anything else, but is it a level of addiction, for want of a better word, that is okay? You know, I get it. I might be addicted to coffee, but actually, it's two a day. Would I hate to be without? Yes. Am I fearful to be without? Yes. But actually, is it bad? No. Okay, fine. But you've yeah. got to ask yourself those questions, I think. You know, for 14 years, I didn't drink. And it's an interesting thing. I never said this 20 years ago in my book. Uh, and I still think the book, Kick the Drink, stands the test of time, changing your relationship with alcohol. There's no question. 14 years later, and it's like meeting an old flame, right? That's what it was like. It's like meeting an old flame that you thought you were still in love with, although I never thought I was still in love with them. And then you see them again, like you were you were really in love with them, right? And then you you break up. And then 14 years later, you go and have a coffee with them. And you go, what did I ever see in you? Yeah, what did I see in you? <laughs> it's a funny thing. <laughs> I mean, alcohol has zero benefits. Know, Let's not sugarcoat it. No. Not, only is yeah. it not, not only is it super bad for you, it literally has zero, zero, zero benefits. It's a shine. I know. We, it's one of those things. <laughs> You know, I sometimes say to clients, you know, if you're craving, in inverted commas, that glass of champagne because you're going to meet with a friend or whatever, it isn't the alcohol no, it's you the want, company. it's the associations, it's isn't it? Like, if you had a, a really nasty, warm, sweet, disgusting glass of wine or champagne in a cracked paper cup, that ain't quite the same. No, no, no. I've, and I said <laughs> that in, my, in, in the book. I do say that. I said it's really weird. It was about six months after I stopped drinking. I wasn't feeling deprived. I was having dinner with my girlfriend at the time, our favorite Italian restaurant. I asked, we always had a bottle of wine, but I wasn't drinking anymore. She was, didn't make any difference to me. I didn't feel deprived. I asked for a water and he put it in a tumbler and it was warm and I felt deprived and I didn't know why. And I yeah. said to my girlfriend at the time, and I asked the waiter, I said, look, do you mind? I said, can you put this in a glass and cold water? I want to see that frost come out. I want a wine glass. And then I went, hang on, why are they called wine glasses? It's just a glass. Exactly. It really <laughs> frustrates me. <laughs> it's just a glass, but it's a nice glass. It feels great. I like drinking stuff yeah. in a wine glass. And yeah. all of a sudden it changes everything. No, well, that's that's my kind of mantra that, you know, I, I say in the book is keep the ritual, but change the ingredients. So if you like having a drink with yeah. friends on a summer's evening, have a drink with yeah. friends, you know, have a lovely glass, but choose to have something alcohol free in it. And definitely don't have a, a crappy tumbler, you know, with some Coke or some orange juice, because, you know, you're not. Okay, 12. I'll give you my best line after your final best line to back off to people. <laughs> so when somebody says to somebody. Why aren't you drinking? They start attacking you a little bit, but in a, in a jovial way, right? So they're like, oh, come on, what's wrong with you? What would be your go-to? What do you say to them? Oh, are you didn't give me time I to know, prep that. I'm sure you've got I, one I beautifully know. lined well, up. Well, I've had, well, <laughs> I had one for years that I've just always, I, I always <laughs> used it. I always used it. Mine was, uh, I just, I, oh, no, no, I'm fine. I just never drink when I'm sober. Other than that, I'm 
<laughs> I like that. That's what, great. What happens is their I, brain fries, Janie. Obviously, yeah, I like that. That's a great I'm, one. When I'm sober, I don't. So at the moment, we're good. And, <laughs> and, then, and their brain doesn't know what to do. They're going, what did he say? Is that thing? Well, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand. I used to say, because I was aggressive, where they go, how come you don't drink? I go, how come you don't take heroin? I was quite aggressive. I was quite aggressive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well. I, like, what <laughs> I mean, I think, I mean, on a serious note, I think there's a lot of people who are coming out of lockdown and they're really worried about coming out of that sort of almost protective bubble if they've stopped drinking. And they're now going to be, you know, getting out into, into clubs oh. or out, not clubs, but, you know, social situations. And it can be a problem. So, you know, on a serious note, I genuinely do recommend that people do prep ahead and give give a heads up you know send a text to friends or whoever you're going to be meeting because if you don't you rock up to the bar and before you know it your usual drink has been put in your yeah. hand and then if you start saying oh well actually you know um actually you know what i'm not before you know it that i'll oh, just have one yeah. and you're into it so actually do give people a heads up you can say whatever you want if you want to lie that's fine if you want to tell the truth if you just want to say you know something i feel absolutely fantastic without it well, whatever it is but do give a heads up and prep how you'll get home early because you will not have such a high boredom threshold <laughs> as you say when people start repeating <laughs> themselves it gets boring real that quick is, do you know what i've love this podcast we normally touch on health and everything else we've never really touched on the importance of alcohol and in relation to coming out of lockdown and what i love about the approach jane is it's not heavy it's the opposite there's some brilliant advice across the spectrum no matter what or how much you drink how much you want to change uh, happy, healthy, sober. That's what you're looking for, guys. You're looking for that. And if you want to see Janie first, you didn't know much about Janie, then check out the TEDx before you go any further on that. Equally, drinking is not an issue to you. And you're thinking, wow, I've never really thought about what I put on my skin or anything else. Those books stand the test of time. And Perfectly Natural Woman. Listen to our Steve right in the afternoon. There's so much I could just go on. <laughs> Watch out when she's doing a talk next. And of course, she was relatively prolific. Before she stopped drinking, now there's no stopping her. She's getting in the thank you very much for coming on. She's getting in the everybody. Come on. <laughs>